Welcome to it, Sports Fans, episode 28, 19th of February, FTBTV podcast. Great to be here. Remember, check us out uh, and subscribe. YouTube, Podbean, if you've got an Android phone, otherwise iTunes. Check out everything in the, dis- the, the links in the description, or the descriptions are in the links there, and you will have us have a look in the bottom section of either Podbean, iTunes, or of course YouTube. And you can get all the links to all of our social media across the web, whether it's uh, Facebook or indeed the Gram. Of course, we're on Twitter as well from the Bleachers TV. So quick intro today, plenty to get through. And today talking about, of course, who the next Manchester United manager should be. I've had my words on, um, I definitely don't think it should be Solskjaer, but who are the options that I think it should be. Then we're going to talk about the Proteas and their result. Of course, they lost to Sri Lanka recently and what I think proceedings should be there. And then we'll end off with the rugby and we'll discuss Robbie Flex tenure as the current Stormers coach. Let's get into it. Manchester United, of course, they went, I think, is it 13, 14 on the spin? But I think it's 12 domestically. So they beat a hapless Chelsea yesterday. But before I get into that, you know, you ever had a friend, right, who really hasn't had much success in the dating world with women until he hits that magical 30 mark? Because generally by then you're making a little bit of money. Stops mattering really what you look like. If you've got enough money, that kind of makes up for it in the world we live in. But let's call said dude Dave, right? Let's say Dave meets a great girl. And all of a sudden, Dave, of course, as with anyone who's uh, in a relationship, they become Dr. Phil and they let you know how great it is to be in a relationship. Like, dude, you need to treat women better. Dude, you need a good woman in your life. And then, of course, the all-time classic. I found the one, bro. Like, I just, I can't believe it took me this long. You know, she's perfect. Everyone knows that, Dave. Uh, And then you're like, oh boy. Like, listen, buddy. I know things were rough for a while. You're a late bloomer at 30. But take it easy. It's been like two and a half months. Relax. Talking about your wife and you've just known her for two and a half months. Take it easy there, buddy. Listen, the honeymoon's always great, all right? But listen, on a honeymoon, her alcoholic brother's not there. You know, her rich mom, who's like a woman of leisure that meddles in everything. She's not there to meddle in your life and be there every Sunday and be there every Tuesday evening after you get back from work. Because her full-time job is just going to brunches. She's not there. You're on honeymoon. Nobody's there. Like, every day somebody picks up your towels. Everybody's on, on the honeymoon. Everybody... Everybody picks up your socks in the morning. There's room service. So you're on honeymoon. It's like you're in a bubble. First two months, she's scrubbing the kitchen. You're scrubbing the kitchen. You're still on your best behavior. You're doing your washing. It's the honeymoon period. So Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, all right, and Man United beat a pathetic Chelsea 2-0 yesterday at Sanford Bridge. So that's 12 in a row, right, locally unbeaten. So since he took over, he's unbeaten on English shores. Or an English competition. That's uh, cups and league included. Our only blemish has been that PSG 2 0 loss, but they're absolutely flying locally. And United, for the first time in 34 years, 34 years, have beaten Spurs, Chelsea, and Arsenal away. All right? And now everyone's saying, Ollie for the job. Get Ollie. Um, no. Calm down. Settle down. I've been through my reasons why not. You can listen to the previous podcast. Listen, if Man United value the long term, you let Oli go back to Norway and you get a manager to give the club some direction. This is Man United. It's not Cardiff. And we know how it didn't work out for Oli then. As Man United fans, stay out your feelings. As football fans, stay out of your feelings. Don't let the emotion wash over you. 
there's clear th there's three for me absolutely clear targets that you should be going after two that are dead on and one which i think is a bit speculative but i would go for it if i was the man united owners number one and i think he he picks himself now he's available he's been on a hiatus He's done his sabbatical, Zinedine Zidane. To those people that say Zidane came in mid-season at Madrid, look how that went. I say settle down. Listen, he'd been assistant to Carlo Ancelotti. He coached the Real Madrid team, uh, B team, for 18 months. He was also, um, in 2010, Jose Mourinho's kind of assistant, in a sense. Not really assistant, because Aito Karanka was uh, assistant. But he was like in and around the team, in Mourinho's team. Kind of consulting, traveling with the team. So Zidane had been around the squad for four or five years already. He'd been at Real Madrid. He's in the culture. Stop it. Look, it's not the same. If United get Zizou, it's clear. It's a clear indication to the league that we mean business. Right? I don't care which player you are worldwide. I don't care who you are. When he calls, you pick up the phone. It's in it in Zidane. Man United need a marquee player. And, and I mean a really marquee player who's on the top shelf. They don't have anybody right now who you could say is top, top shelf. I like the goalkeeper who's, I don't think, the best. But he's, he's very, very good. And he's certainly in the top five. Other than that, Man United need a Neymar, a Griezmann, or an Mbappe kind of player. Somebody who will take control of a game. And create those moments. And I mean A-level, top shelf. Nobody has to think about it. That guy's world class. There's no arguments. There's no back and forth. They don't have that guy right now. You bring Zidane in. All of these guys become an option. The man's got three Champions League titles in a row. It's never been done before. Like, I don't need to say more. He's in it in Zidane for crying out loud. If Man United want to bring back... An elite mindset, he's the guy, no matter what he costs. If United are serious, he's the guy at any price. They must pay the going rate. At number two, for me, this one's clear. He's at Napoli at the moment. It's Carlo Ancelotti. The only criticism, and this is where I would say any club that gets this guy needs to be careful, is that he's a cup specialist. He doesn't win enough titles. Like, isn't it crazy to think that the Milan team of Cafu, Kaka, Maldini, Shevchenko won one title? He was there for eight years. Carlo was there for eight years. It doesn't even sound right. Like, listen to those names. Cafu, Kaka, Maldini, Shevchenko. I haven't, I haven't even said the other guys who were in the team. Ambrosini, one title, eight years. Doesn't even sound right. Listen, what he does have is one Premier League. One Syria, a Bundesliga, and a French. It just sounds so wrong. He's been in the game forever. And it just always seems like he's at the top of the game. What he is, though, even, even if he's a cup specialist, what he does do is build great teams. He's shown that twice now because he did it at Chelsea and then, of course, that Milan team. That Milan dynasty. Listen, people remember his Milan team, but remember his Chelsea team in 2010 scored 103 goals. And they conceded 32. Listen, only Pep's side last season have a better goal difference at the end of a the season. They had a plus 71 to that Chelsea team. Pep had plus 79 last season. That's the only team that's historically been better than Ancelotti's 2010 team. So he builds great teams. It's what I love about him. And he's a coach. You don't need to worry about him. Give me any players. He's your typical Italian style coach. And you're not sacrificing quality of football with Ancelotti. He'll play the diamond. He'll play a four, flat 4-4-2. Four, four, he'll play 4-3-3. Three, three. He's a coach. Give him what you got. He'll make it work. He'll take the ingredients and he'll turn it into a five-star dish. Regardless of what you give. He's shown that he will build great teams. Listen, I think with him as well, what you know for sure is Man United could really go for it. I mean, if they can go for it with Zidane, they can really go for it with this guy in the transfer market. And I mean massively aggressively. You can really push the boat out. 150, 160, go and shop, maybe get two off the top shelf. 
Maybe you get a Neymar and you get a Veron. Veron might cost you something like 100 million. Neymar, 180, 190 million, maybe even 200. Go and get those guys because Ancelotti isn't going to upset those guys. He's never upset anybody from what I've read, from what I've seen. I don't think I've ever heard a guy saying, Carlo, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard the guy speak. Looks like the Godfather. Relaxed. And he's got that. He's got the people's eye going. So you can, you can, you know, you can get top shelf talent, and nobody's going to be upset. There's going to be no egos. Ancelotti never had that. Listen, United, United have no genuine world class players right now. But you could really chase Neymar, Veron, Cruz, and build from there. And you know, Carlo will make it work. Not because I'm guessing, because he's done it. Not once. Not twice. Not three times. But four times. Because everywhere he's gone, he's been nothing but pleasant. They've played great football. And he's, he's won, although not as many titles as he probably should have, he's won titles. They play great football and he generally plays that diamond. But Man United are lacking that one. And, and at the top, you probably need two or three really world-class guys. And he's done it. Listen, the man has a record equaling three Champions League titles. His Milan teams always seem to be in the semis or the finals. And it should really be four. And then he'd have the most Champions League titles by himself. Istanbul was madness. Cafu, Nesta, Maldini, Kaka, Zambrotta, Perlo, Siedov. The man can keep a lid on egos. Come on. Do the right thing. If United are serious, they sign him up. And the third one, and this is the one that I think... I think I would go for if I'm any of the top four clubs next. It's Eddie Howe. It's Eddie Howe. I mean, listen, this third choice, he doesn't really need explaining. He's the long-term guy. What you need to do is you explain to the fans, we're doing a Fergie now. Right? He needs three years to get the club right and shape it in his image. So the next three years, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Get your seatbelts on. We're doing this thing. It'll be painful, but like Fergie, following that three years, it'll be 10 years of utter dominance. Listen, what Howe's done at Bournemouth is silly. It's ridiculous. It's, you, you cannot fathom what Eddie Howe on that budget has produced in terms of quality of football and league standing. Don't get sucked into the Oli vibe. I've spoken about why. You can listen to that on the previous podcasts. And remember, honeymoon isn't real life. There is no indication that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, once he's truly in control of a football club, can deliver. It's Zidane number one. It's Ancelotti number two. And if you really want to go long term, and if you really want to do the United way, Eddie Howe is your guy. That's the way I do it. That is the way I do it. So listen, the Proteas played cricket recently in the test match against Sri Lanka, the first of the series. In what was probably the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Let me tell you a real life story. It happened to me. All right. It happened. This really happened. I was once dating a girl. And when we met, she was super fit. And loved adventuring. And about two to three months into the relationship, she started gaining some weight. And we stopped doing cool stuff. Well, she stopped doing cool stuff. And I just kept living my best life. So eventually I was like, why do I need this anchor holding me down? Let me just address it. Like, either she can get in shape or... Keep this thing moving. That's just how I think about these things. So one day I raised the issue regarding her expanding waist, for lack of a better term. I didn't, I didn't quite put it, I didn't massage it like that at the time. Because it had been, it was clear for everyone to see. But anyway, she acted like I was the sicko. And she lost her cool. We literally broke up that day and I felt nothing. I felt a zero. Listen, I fell into the relationship and I got into you because at the time she was a Ferrari. 
And then when I, when I addressed it, she'd become a Prius. That's not how relationships work. You don't get to be who you want to be. You entice somebody up front and then you're someone completely different. That's not going to work. Listen, you have to be what I fell for in the beginning, not what you want to be. And the same goes, went for me. So had to keep this thing moving. Listen, that's a real story that happened to me, people. Stuff's happening out there. That is no lie. My point is this, Faf Duplessis and the Proteas, right, were bowled out twice for scores under 260 in this last game. Now, I know what you're thinking. Surely they played against McGrath, Gillespie, Lee, and Warren at the Wacker. Surely. No, that, no, no, that's not what happened. Listen, this is Sri Lanka, a team which just landed on South African soil 12 days ago. Had no time to acclimatize. Played one three-day game, basically, where they batted. Let's also be clear. Australia beat, Australia beat them in the first test by an innings and in the second test by 366 runs in the last series. Australia batted three times in the whole series. So in the four innings that were available over the two tests, Australia batted three times. They scored 534 for five declared. 323. And then 196 for three, declared. So 534, 323 in the game, which they won by an innings. And then they, they scored 196 for three in the other innings, declared. So they lost eight wickets, wickets essentially, in three innings. Sorry, 18. That's 18 wickets in three innings. I'm going to let that sink in. Listen, so the Sri Lankan bowling lineup isn't exactly Freddy Krueger, right? It's not the scariest thing around. Let's be honest. In two test matches, they took 18 wickets. And they only bowled three times. 5.34 for five. Like, why is nobody willing to say that Faf Duplicy isn't good enough? Considering that all he does is bat. Don't give me this captain nonsense. People act like he's Steve or he's not. He's not an inspirational figure. There's nothing about him that says he stands out. All he does is bat five. I hope people realize that he's got 900 in 57 test matches. The worst part of all of this is he scores at less than three and over. He's got a 45 strike rate. Listen, so his one innings, one innings in 2012, right, in Australia, we all remember when he blocked, it was like 100 of like 310 balls, I think, 110 of 300 and, and, and something balls. Is that what we're still tolerating seven years later? Is that why he's in the team? Because it's not good enough to tolerate that because all he does is put the other batsmen under pressure. That's all he does with his slow scoring. He scores less than, it's like two and a half and over. It's unacceptable. And he's only got 900s in 57 test matches. And he doesn't do anything else. He's not a great fielder. He's not doing anything else. Like The captain business, I don't get it. Like, you should be a good enough player first and then we'll worry about who's captain. Like, unless you're special, unless you are Alan Border, you are Steve Waugh. Unless you're one of those guys. Mm, and he's definitely not that. We can all say that. Listen, if you bat for your average, I need you to have Jacques Callis numbers. I need you to average 50. So Faf Duplicy bats for his average, and he's got a 42 test average. And that's all he does. And he puts the team under pressure because he's blocking half the time. So he's never like rotating the strike, you know, going at four and over or something spectacular. And he's only got 900 after 57 tests. Listen, Bavuma isn't good enough, but... He's a great fielder, so I, c I can kind of swallow that as a batsman, he's probably on the edge. He's only got 100 in far too many games, so he needs to, he needs to step it up. But I can swallow the bitter pill. 100 isn't enough. Bavuma's not good enough. But, but he's a great fielder. He's, he's a generational fielder. Some of the things I see him do. So he's a playmaker in the field. I can, I can almost tolerate that because somebody like Bavuma's worth 10 or 15 runs in the field. And then a catch or a run out here and there, as we've seen. Let's be honest, 
the biggest problem, and I'll say it again, Ham- Hashim Amla is awful now. Just drop him. His beard isn't going to haunt us in our sleep. He's an absolute horror show. Drop him now. It's over. Listen, the the last like match-winning 100 under pressure he scored was against England in January 2016. That's three years ago. And at that stage, he averaged 51. Three years later, where we are now, he averages 46. If you don't understand in cricket terms, that's monstrous. In order to lose a, like five runs off your test average, in three years, and that's... Amla's like an uber version of Faf. Like he's really shocking in the field. He's been dropping catches left, right, and center. So he's not athletic. So he's not offering you anything with, unless he's batting. And he hasn't played a momentous, meaningful innings in three years. That 100 against England, January 2016. Listen, it's ridiculous because South Africa have three bowlers who will be in the top 10 list statistically of all time. All right? Three of our bowlers. So this is the perfect time to transition because it means our batsmen are never going to be chasing monster scores. I mean, very rarely do teams make 300 against South Africa. Very, very rarely against this bowling lineup. So bring the youngsters in. Do it now, before Stain retires. I mean, Stain's probably got a year and a half left. Vernon, if he doesn't get in shape, he's probably got another year and a half left as well. And then you've got Rabada. All of you is great. So nobody's going to make monster scores against this bowling. It's generational. I mean, it's second for me all time to that great Australian bowling lineup. So bring the youngsters in. Drop Fuff. Drop Amla now. It gives you probably a year, year and a half to let somebody play somewhere between 15 and 20 test matches. By that time, we've kind of tried four or five guys. If a guy's not good enough, you can kind of rotate him over the next year and a half. But they've got to go. Amla in particular, it's, it's now getting embarrassing. It's ridiculous. Listen, so it's perfect now. Because the batting's been getting away with it. Even when A.B. de Villiers was there, the batting's been shocking. That's with A.B. de Villiers, and he was starting to average like 50. Listen, the bowlers have carried this team. There's never been 12 months where the batting actually came together, where Amla, Faf, and A.B. batted well, all batted well in that 12 months. I mean, if you remember that Australian team, there was a time when Hayden, Langer, Ponting, Martin, they were all on. They were all singing at a stage. And you knew every test match, at least two of them are going to make 60 or more. The bowling's been carrying the team with A.B. De Villiers in the team. And now he's gone. And now these two jokers are still left and are being horribly, horribly exposed. Listen, Amla and Duplessis are not what we fell in love with. Just drop them. Just drop them. Like, what is the sentiment thing? This is international sport. Just chop them. They aren't good enough. Let's move on. Our bowling will carry us as it, as it has done anyway. This last loss was horrendous. And if, and if we're keeping Fuff because he's captain, his inability to bowl a team out for under 300 in the fourth innings is purely embarrassing. A team that has only played one three-day game been in the country for 12 days. Been thrashed by Australia over two test matches. And you go and lose like that. Come on. It's time to hashtag move on. Hashtag move on, guys. Get it together. So we're going to finish off in the high felt. Oh my goodness. Listen, the Blue Bulls had to wait an extra 30 minutes or so. To kick off the game against the Stormers on Saturday. Um, yeah, I think the, the everybody's saying Stormers were stuck in traffic. The Stormers should have stayed in that traffic. And just driven from there to Cape Town without playing the game. I think they might have put up a better challenge for the Bulls if they didn't pitch up. It would have been a harder game for the Bulls if the Stormers didn't pitch up. It should have been just the Bulls playing 
against no one. And it would have been a far better competition than what the Stormers put up. The worst defense in South Africa last year held the Stormers to three points. Let that sink in. The worst, and I'm not saying my opinion is that, statistically the worst defense of all the South African conference teams last season, the Bulls, they conceded the most points, held the Stormers to three points. I don't want to hear about organizational issues, right? The Stormers had 10 capped Springboks in their starting 15 on Saturday. They lost 43. 43. Listen, the only thing more ridiculous than those superhero kits is that Robbie Fleck hasn't been fired yet. He should never have made the bus after the game. If you saw his interview, he's a defeated man. He knows he's he, he's drowning. He's drowning. Robbie Fleck is drowning and it's poor. I don't want to speak about the organizational issues because that's not a problem. That's not the problem. The Stormers, the Stormers last year scored less points than the Sunwolves, who were the worst team in the competition. So this has been coming. Listen, the Stormers won six of the 15 games last season in Super Rugby, and they've got, as I said, this time, uh, that on Saturday, they started 10 Springboks. They've got Springboks everywhere in that team. One might say the South African pool's not that strong. Yes, but the not-so-strong pool, the best of the worst, are all at the Stormers. So the Lions are on another level because they've got team chemistry, and they're riding high. But the Stormers still have 10 Springboks. And that's without Etzebeth, regardless of what you think of him. He's a springbok. So the best of the worst, this, I, I'm not saying that the South African conference is the best. I'm very, very honest. There's the Lions and then there's rubbish. I'm very, very clear on that. What I'm saying is the Stormers have all the springboks in their setup. That leads me to one thing, to one conclusion. You can't win six games out of 15 with 10 spring box in your setup. 11 if you can't, it's a bit. And I, like, I've been trying to think, is, do you think Robbie Flex having financial problems? He's not. He comes from a legacy family in, in the Western Cape. He went to an elite boys school. So he's got plenty of money. It's not the financial thing. No, ma no matter what's happening at the institution, the players are getting paid. I have it on good authority that they're getting paid. So it's not that. Robbie, do your job. And he showed that he is incapable. A huge part of coaching. Listen, a, a big part of a big part of rugby is rugby is a coaching sport. It's a highly technical sport. If you're not organized, you will be exposed. And the Bulls were the worst attack last year, and they scored 40 points. The, excuse me, the worst defense last year were, were the Bulls. They held the Stormers to three. If you watch that game, that is a team that has given up on their coach. That is a team that has given up. They were so badly organized. Rugby is a coaching sport. The Stormers were awful. They looked like an under-14 D team. Alignment was off. The defensive lines are... I, I don't even know if there is a plan there. But it's been coming. They lost, they only, they lost 9 of their 15 games last year. It's over, guys. Listen, Robbie... Maybe you go to Saracens. Maybe you send him to Saracens. Surely Jan Rupert or some of the South African guys can hook him up. He's a, he's a Western Province legacy family guy. They'll look after him. He goes and does the Hanson thing where he coaches overseas like the All Blacks coaches do. Let him go and learn his trade there at a slightly, at a slightly easier level because the Northern Hemisphere is where all the Southern Hemisphere guys go and retire. And then come back in five or six years. Do a Nakama. Go and earn your pounds. Go and relax. It'll be nice. You'll be living in a nice country. Go and learn your trade where there's no pressure, really. It's a retirement league up north. And then in five or six years' time, once you've learned your trade properly, because I don't think he was ever ready for this job. I'm not sure how Robbie Fleck got this job. And it's clear now the Stormers are being exposed. Get yourself to Saracens. Even if you're not the head coach, learn how to coach Robbie. 
and we'll see you in five or six years. Absolutely shambolic. And I'm being kind. At least the Lions won. So there's a hooray there. Thought I'd just throw that in at the end. Folks, that is from the bleachers for today. Thank you so much for joining me tomorrow. We've got plenty of Premier League talk this week, of course. Plenty happening at Chelsea and, and plenty at Arsenal, plenty at Spurs. Talk about whether Harry Kane's been missed by Spurs. We'll talk about that this week. And plenty more on the rugby front. I'll be talking about the Bulls. They're acquiring of Dwayne Vermeulen, whether that's going to work out and exactly what my predictions are for the season in Super Rugby and what I'd like to see from all the South African teams. For now, that is it from the Bleachers. We'll be back tomorrow. Thank you for joining me.